Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the weekly Q&A video. Thanks to those of you that took to Twitter at OTRS Central is the Twitter handle that you should follow and submitted your questions there as requested. Got enough to do a full Q&A, so let's go ahead and do that. And if it's your first time happening on upon this channel, you should probably smash that subscribe button. Or if you follow me on Twitter but don't subscribe to the channel, like, why would you do that? Don't you think you should subscribe to the channel? Subscribe or die, damn it. It's back. Come on. Let's do this. Let's get this channel to 20,000 subscribers really quickly. Can we do that? Can we get over that hump? Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and get started with today's Q&A. James Voluca, also known as at Sinner51190 on Twitter. He's got a couple of questions. I'm sure one of these is an attempt to troll me. Oh, lo and behold, what do you know? Trying to say that I refuse to acknowledge Reigns as the heel that he's finally become. Babyface, sir, babyface. Therefore, the second part of your uh, statement there, which is a question that is ridiculous that I will not answer. I do not have to answer. I am not required to answer, so therefore I will not. Um, he does ask, though, good question. Given how well Roman has knocked his character change out of the park, is it safe to say that the fans calling for such a change since the Rumble in 2015 were correct? Me personally, I'll take the Tribal Chief character over Cena 2.0 any day of the week. Yes, thousands times yes. Like, the real time to have launched this character uh, before it was arguably too late would have been after he beat Taker at WrestleMania, what was that, 33? Like, this should have been when they did it. Um, but yeah, I appreciate the fact that they realized that his previous heel character, heel character, that Cena 2.0 crap wasn't working. So they went with the big baby face turn, baby face turn. And it's worked out incredibly well. Like, he looks like a star. He feels like a star. He acts like a star. He actually is a star. Like, it's been incredibly successful. Uh, at Dalek of Chaos, would you consider doing a video on your top 10 best and worst title belt designs? Uh, honestly, Dallas, it's not really something that I'm all that interested in. I'd never say never, but I would, I would really doubt it. Like, that just doesn't seem like a video that... I have interest in doing it this time. But in three months from now, I could be desperately searching for something to talk about, and we might come back to this, and that might be whole video. Uh, Joseph Moran, should I, be a, should I be glad that I'm a mark for Rey Mysterio and not John Cena like the rest of my generation is? Yes. Yes. I'm glad you're not a mark for a guy that helped kill the company. Congratulations, sir. You have some brains. Um, Joseph Moran also asked, any advice on my road to save wrestling? Um, don't take anything that Meltzer and the, the Meltzerites say about what constitutes good professional wrestling as gospel. In fact, when you think about in this country, at least when you think about what actually draws money, uh, if Dave says something is good, then think the opposite. And that will actually be what draws money. Like stay away from that crowd, stay away from the crowd that overly emphasizes and over focuses on one type of one style of Japanese hardcore, no selling bullshit wrestling and thinking that that's what really makes stars and draws money, especially in this country. Cause I promise you it done. And it's been proven time after time after time. It has been Uh Nebuch Sid, good old disco Ben asked if you could do a Mount Rushmore of wrestling moves, what would they be? And why is it Sig's big boot off the turnbuckle four times? Because it's the greatest move in professional wrestling history. That's why. <laughs> you, you made me giggles. You made me giggles. I now follow you on Twitter because you made me giggles. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate that. Byron Andreas. Uh, with the tribute show for Brody Lee, what responsibilities do you feel wrestling companies have to a family when a wrestler dies. Also, how do you feel WWE should have helped the Benoit family, maybe getting his older son counseling and the Brian Pillman family? Great questions. Um, what responsibilities do they have? I mean, it could be the smart ass and say, well, since the wrestlers aren't technically employees, they have none. I mean, from the legal sense, they technically don't have any. Like for talking about being good corporate citizens and just being uh, good to fellow men and women, like, should they be taking care of folks like this? Yes. Um, I mean, how should the WWE organization have helped the Benoit family? I guess tough. Maybe getting his older son counseling, perhaps, but does counseling automatically going to guarantee to work to take away any pain that came from that? I mean, really? 
Like, imagine thinking that sitting in counseling is going to take away the fact that you've now got to live with the stigma the rest of your life, that your dad's a double murderer and then took his own life. Like, I'm sorry, I just can't see how counseling is going to help that very much, personally. And then the Brian Pillman family? Eh. Yeah, maybe. You know, but... You know, how, then when do you cut that off? When do you stop? Like, what does real help look like? Does that make sense? Uh, Jack asks, have you ever watched Cobra Kai? No. Uh, NC-17 Clark, why did Dixie Carter get so much shit from fans and yet Tony Khan gets almost none? Because at least TNA got one million viewers every week, whereas AEW can only dream of doing that. Hypocritical much, am I right? Um, yes and no. Uh, yes, you know, compared to TNA and the numbers that they used to get, AEW doesn't measure up. You're absolutely right. Uh, but then we could also say, like, if you were able to have arenas full of fans, that uh, AEW would be able to go out on the road and not have to wrestle in just in front of a few hundred fans. They could at least draw a few thousand consistently. Or TNA, you couldn't really have that confidence that they could do so. You could also say, you talk about return on investment. Like, AEW has a very large roster, but I can't imagine their financial investment is anywhere close to what TNA had when you're talking about at one time, you have guys like Hogan, Nash, Booker T, Sting, Kurt Angle. I could go on and on and on and on with the big names, the legends that they had under their umbrella. AEW doesn't nearly have that. So I would have expected TNA, frankly, uh, to do better ratings during that time because they were featuring more big established names in wrestling history. So the context matters there a little bit. Uh, Mukahid Killing. What are your five favorite matches from 2020, and who is the best wrestler currently not signed with either WWE or AEW? Um, I don't know the answer to that second question and that first question. Five favorite matches? Um, you know, because 2020, like the first several months of the year, was a year that I wasn't incredibly invested in wrestling, let's be clear here. And, you know, I came back in August and really started getting back into the rhythm and flow of things. Um... But I'm sure if I had to really sit down and think about my top five matches from 2020, probably be the Tribal Chief on there a couple of times. Probably be the Boneyard match at WrestleMania 36. It'd also probably be that a Firefly Funhouse match at WrestleMania 36. Uh, those would be some other think of. Uh, Marsman267, also known as Reese Wilson94. Uh, do you remember when you coined the term the Breakfast Club for Hunter and his guys? Was always curious. Uh, yeah, this goes back before YouTube. Uh, it was just it was always something like probably back 2007, 8, 9 range, somewhere in there where I really started to talk about them being the breakfast club. Um, I, I, I could just see it. Like it was so obvious to me. Um, so that it, it, it was before we actually came on YouTube. It really was when I started first using that. Uh, at Principal NYNB, back in 2013, you never, never really touched on Taker versus Punk. What did you think of them using Paul Bear's death as the basis of the feud, and should wrestling use deaths for stories? Um, I wasn't huge on that feud. Using Paul Bear's death as the base of the feud seemed kind of flimsy and weak to me, personally. Uh, do I think you could use them as... Storyline basis is yes. Do I think it's uh, a bit classless and tasteless? Yes, but that doesn't automatically mean that you shouldn't do that. You know, the world is about exploitation, exploitation including death. Why should wrestling be any different? Afifi Hassan, what do you think will hap What do you think will happen to the wrestling business today if the Click never existed? Is a faction like the NWO or DX uh, will still be exist? I'm not really sure what that part of the question is. Also, what would be your dream WrestleMania match between members of the Breakfast Club versus the Click? Like, how fantastic would that be that Triple H would get to be on both teams? He would get double the payout, and he'd be able to wrestle each other. Like, that's a WrestleMania dream match in and of itself, isn't it? It's God versus God. <laughs> um, what would happen to wrestling business today if the Click never existed? Um... I mean, when you really think about it, like, how much of an impact did the Click as a group really have? Because by mid-96, Nash and Hall were down to WCW. 
Like, and, and, and the company, WWF at that time, wasn't that good anyway. So I think the click sometimes is overblown in terms of its impact as a group. Like maybe people at the time, you know, sat there and hate, hated those guys and felt like they played politics and everything else. And they did, but, you know, sometimes some of those guys got politics played with them because they also weren't very good. Uh, Horror Movie Review 73, do you think 98 and 2000 were the best years of the Attitude Era compared to 99 and 2001? Um, yeah, probably. Especially 98. Yeah. Liam Patrick, 1993, what's Uncle Dave Meltzer's worst take? Um, God. He has some good ones, and he's had a really, a lot of really dumb, bad ones. Like, he really started jumping the shark, putting... Omega and Okada's matches at six and a half and seven stars. Like his worst take, honestly, are his star ratings. And not just because they're his star ratings. I think it's the fact that he tries to hold that up as one consistent standard across professional wrestling. And he doesn't view it from a bunch of different perspectives. It's from his very narrow scope of what he likes about wrestling. And that's it. Um, other worst takes of his I could think of is saying that WrestleMania 17 is the greatest WrestleMania of all time. It's not. Uh, saying that WrestleMania 3 didn't draw 90 plus thousand people. It did. Uh, and you, he has decades of bad takes. So it can be hard to pick truly what's the worst one. Uh, Nick, by the byways, which was the defining moment of the 2000s? Sid shattering his leg or Scott Steiner doing math? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fat Jason Kidd, what was your 2020 feud of the year and match of the year? Uh, feud of the year would be Roman Reigns against Jey Uso, especially because his cousin just couldn't get with it. And then their first match... And their second match, like I'd pick from one of those two probably as my match of the year. Um, Psycho Walker with Kenny Omega now being a double world champion in two different promotions. I was wondering if you or any other, if you know of any other wrestlers to achieve this. I can only think of Muda, Vader, Shane Douglas, Chono, and Fujinami. Omega's a double world champion? Did I miss something? I guess I gotta start paying attention. All right? Don't I? I didn't know he was. So I, I don't even, I don't even know. Like I'm lost now. Uh, Mukahi Killink is Charlotte Flair a member of the Breakfast Club? No, they have enough men in that group already. Uh, <laughs> the Zero Cool asks, "What's your Mount Rushmore of, of fa wrestling finishes?" Psycho said, "Big boot off the second rope four times." There's your fucking Mount Rushmore. <laughs> Cairo's older brother. Hogan or Savage, whose gimmick would work today? Savage, by a long shot, it would be Savage. Um, Callum Burgess, 14, do you think Brian Pillman would have been WWF champion if he didn't pass? Uh, if he was, it would have only been for a very, very short period of time and is a transitional guy. Wrestling Rants, when did you realize, Ugh, that Triple H, Ugh, was actually God, Ugh? About 2002, 2003. When he had that reign of terror on Raw, like that's when I realized that this man made miracles. And then when you find out that he's actually boning Stephanie in real life and he's going to marry the boss's daughter, I'm like, that's godlike. And I've believed in him ever since. The Den Sidron, do you think Sting was a five-tool talent? Yes, I do. Um, California EST 96, I was wondering what your thoughts and opinions are. Daniel Bryan, Brian Danielson, are you a fan of any of the American Dragon's work? How do you feel that he got as popular as he did this past decade? Well, lots of guys get popular on the independent scene, and then people assume that that automatically carries over to a much wider audience. It doesn't. I don't watch a ton of Brian Danielson's earlier work, so I'm not that familiar with the American Dragon stuff. But admittedly, you know, from what I understand, stuff that I have caught over the years, like, I don't see what was so special about him at the time. I really don't. Like, what was so fucking special about him because, compared to any other dozens or hundreds of guys on the scene? Uh, Daniel Bryan, though, I think has become a well-rounded performer. He's somebody that I actually enjoy watching. That 10 years ago, if you held the gun to my head, I said there is no way in hell I would make my reputation here on Twitter if it, and YouTube making a living off of bashing Daniel Bryan and the people that like Daniel Bryan. So 
You know, I was certainly wrong on him, but he, he worked and he grew and he improved as a performer significantly. Lord JCW, what's a gimmick that didn't work in previous eras of WWE uh, that you think could work now? Gimmick that didn't work in previous eras in WWE that you think could work now. It worked back then, right to censor. But I think now, especially with the cancel culture and the woke shit and Me Too and everything else, like you could take right to censor and that could be the main event gimmick. Like it would piss so many people off. Like, so not that it didn't work in the Attitude Era. Unfortunately, I think it was certainly a side effect that it killed some gimmicks and killed some per performers' careers. But that gimmick now would be perfectly suited for this era. Uh, at ENC98, is it fair to say that Brock Lesnar was a face of WWE from 2016 to 2020? Uh, probably, and that's a good explanation for why business went down in the toilet. Um, let's see here, who else? Uh, Stephen Penafiel, Ruck Fool's Life, yes. Happy New Year's, Jeff. Thank you. Same to you. With Roman Reigns now showing off his true potential with the Tribal Chief gimmick, does this further validate how stupid it was for Lesnar to end Undertaker's streak? Yes. 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 Let's be clear. If your question started was, how stupid was it to have Lesnar end Taker's streak? The answer is always going to be yes. Always going to be yes. And almost seven years later, that opinion has not changed. I've only grown more determined in believing that. Uh, the Real Mr. X asks, what's your favorite off the rope show gimmick and why? <laughs> oh man, there were so many of them. Uh, <laughs> obligatory Cena time. Uh, me <laughs> Um, Mark's assume Kelly Kelly position. <laughs> Metal D's, no doubt about it. <laughs> um, oh crap. Favorite gimmick and why? Uh, I always loved the newscaster style. God damn it, we're professionals here! Um, but I think my favorite gimmick, and some of you are going to bring up the Blue Bort, and you're going to bring up, and that's maybe more character than gimmick per se, you're going to bring up the, um, uh, assume Jeff Jarrett position, uh, but I'll, I'll go with Smokey. I think that was the gimmick, that was the character that got the most over. Still carries over to this day. I said that was probably my favorite one, because I thought it was the best one, personally. And he was just a 30 pound gray pussycat marking out for Mark Henry, and it worked. It connected. It absolutely did. Um, George asks, why doesn't WWE bring back old pay per view names like Armageddon, Judgment Day, No Mercy? Um, yeah, I'm kind of in agreement with you. Like, I could do away with the money in the banks of the world and the TLCs of the world and the Hello in the Cells of the world. I'd like for them to go back to the more traditional names of the past or create new ones, but either way, you know, bring back King of the Ring as a fucking pay-per-view. Um, Mr. Jinx 05, who caused more destruction in their decade of doom, John Cena in WWE or the Memphis mid-card piece of crap Defender in TNA? Uh, ooh, that's a good question. And I think it's Cena. Not only did Cena bury a bunch of people, but business decreased significantly during his decade on top as that prop of the company. The founder was always dealing with a bit of a deficit. And while he's an a-hole and while he ruined a lot of careers too, he also gave people opportunities, especially those that didn't have to work with him. Um, but, you know, that was an attempt to bring back and keep fans of the old WCW. Uh I think it was Cena. I think Cena's had more devastating destruction during his decade of doom than the founder, believe it or not. Uh, who was a worse WCW uh, World Heavyweight Champion? The Memphis mid-card piece of crap or, yes, A, I know B for you was Vince Russo, A, Memphis mid-card piece of crap, always. <laughs> always. So I think I've hit most every question here. I might have missed a couple, and it's just kind of the way it's feeding through my Twitter. So if I did, I certainly apologize. Uh, thanks, you guys, for um, sending in your questions, watching this video. Again, make sure you smash that subscribe button. Follow me on Twitter. I would also like to know, give me some feedback on how the microphone sounds. Um, since I got a new mic, I want to make sure that the sound quality is actually better. 
Uh, lighting quality down here in the uh, wrestling man room will be better once my lights that I ordered two weeks ago actually come in. They were only supposed to be here December 27th, and then it's now January 2nd, and they're still not here! So hopefully they'll be here soon. Uh, but other than that, again, guys, thank you for your support. I look forward to more Q&As and more videos and lots of great content throughout the course of the year. I'll see you later.